Thank you, Daniela, for, for the intro. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. There's still a few people joining us. Um, yeah, this is a, I hope this is going to be a very interesting conversation. At least we've done a, a LARP version of this before the event, and it was really nice. And I have a notebook, so it makes it even more serious. So uh, we're here to talk about um, current and future challenges in uh, game engineering. We, we've all been through quite a few. Uh, we've been in the industry for a while, and we know a few things that we like, a few things that we dislike, and a few things that we don't know if we like or dislike. But there are things that we have to do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm going to start by bringing up a bit of the past. Uh, and we're going to start with programming languages. So, way before um, we had these amazing games, um, people started programming in machine code, which then uh, led into people uh, wanting to make it easier, so they started programming in assembly language. Uh, and then at some point, C, C++, and some, some other languages, tons of languages that we all know. Um, with that evolution, we started to uh, gain some things and lose some things. So when we were just doing games in assembly, we were uh, very aware of what was going on, how it was going on, and how performant uh, our code is, because we, we immediately knew uh, where things could go astray. Uh, whereas now, we have a ton of abstraction layers between ourselves and the metal. So I'd like to start with how we've come to this point. And obviously, this would be like a subject for hours and hours of discussion, so we'll try to, <laughs> to cap it. But yeah. What do you think, Jonathan, about the evolution of these languages? Well, the, the problem is we're human beings, right? And humans like to observe patterns and then extrapolate patterns long after the patterns are correct anymore. And it takes us a long time to realize that they're wrong unless a big disaster happens. And if the problems are slow and uh, growing slowly, sometimes we don't notice. So in these early days, you know, people programmed, uh, people don't have a lot of clarity about this, but originally, right, there was machine language, which is a different thing from assembly language. Assembly language is high level compared to machine yeah. language, right? Um, and that brought productivity that nobody could really argue with. It was obvious. And then when we had programming languages like Fortran C and going on to C++, I don't think C++ really adds any productivity to C, but C and Fortran and all those are definitely a step above assembly language. And it was so obvious back at the time, it was inarguable that just programmers were better when they used these languages. And the problem was that we, uh, we just decided that that was the pattern. The more high level the language is for some definition of high level that nobody could ever agree on, um, the more productive programmers will be. And there was an idea that I heard a lot in the 80s and 1990s, which was um, programmers write on average 10 lines of code a day regardless of the language. And so if you can make those 10 lines say more, you can make programmers more productive. And that hasn't really worked at all. Yeah. Um, the problem is just, um, there are a lot of problems, but we're not very good well, we're very good at making claims, right? Somebody designs a new language and they claim, hey, this language will be great because of X, Y, and Z. Um, but nobody ever stops to really figure out if X, Y, and Z are strictly good. They never really stop to measure if X, Y, and Z are accomplished by the language. And then they never stop to look at like what other things are caused 
by what we're introducing? What, what about W, Q, and K, which are, are probably bad things, right? And so we just don't do this cost-benefit analysis, and it just requires being a little bit adult, because you want to be excited. Like somebody comes up with a cool idea for a language or a cool demo, and everybody wants to get excited about it, and it's, it's easy to be excited. Um, it's actually hard to come up with good ideas that really actually help, right? Yeah. And people just haven't seemed willing historically to really do the diligence to make sure that the ideas really help. Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm very excited about Rust, and I never used it, and I have no idea why I should be excited. But and, and, and that's contagious, right? The, the whole excitement part. Um, what do you think was the turning point upon which um, nowadays we started to consider um, high-level abstractions or um, uh, paradigms like object-oriented and when do you think was a turning point that that whole thing changed um, in games where we started to think okay this is the way to go I'm, I'm not saying this is what solves problems yeah far from it uh, I'm just saying that at some point people started to think okay these abstractions this kind of uh, uh, abstract notions of uh, representations of knowledge actually benefits my work and my products and my games. When do you think that became a thing? Uh, it probably depends on who you're really talking about because different, different people in the industry follow different paths, but really in the 1980s, like very early, um, you know, you had some of the, ironically, some of the simpler games, what we would consider simpler today, like the Infocom text adventures, right. were all built in these highly abstracted systems, right? Um, that, which there was a technical reason for, strictly because they wanted to retarget it to all these home computers and just recompile the game, right? right. Um, but also because that was the idea, like we want a higher level world representation to help us tell better fiction or something, right? I wasn't there, so I can't give you a very <laughs> yeah. Yeah. accurate. But it started very early. And the thing is, it's true sometimes. This is, again, the, this is the problem. This is why it's not easy. Abstraction actually is good a lot of the time, right? Um, you know, all the time when I, even now when I program, I use something like a C program level of technical abstraction, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm making all sorts of data structures that represent some idea in the game, and those are important abstractions to me that help me think about the program, right? So if it were in assembly language, you would still have those, but they would be harder to see and, yeah. and harder to understand. So the problem is... Everybody wants to do more faster, which I would love to as well. And so they come up with some idea that a bigger, better abstraction is going to make that possible. Because that was the pattern in the past. And I actually don't want to make this discussion too much about performance. I th there is historically very observably been a great deal of performance loss that happens when you introduce these abstractions. I don't really want to argue that today because I think it's obvious and people have heard it a lot and it's very easy. There's just certain classes of people who just want to disregard that argument. They just want to say, well, you know, I don't care if I'm as fast as possible. I can do this right. thing over here. And you know, what you end up with is programs that are like a thousand or 10 times, 10,000 times as slow as they should be, which is what we have today. But because people hear that all the time, I'd rather not hammer on that. And I would rather go in the other direction, just how understandable is the program? How simple is it? How debuggable is it? How, how long does it take you to write the code? Because the promise was, if we adopt all these abstractions, we're speaking very generally, you know, but you, it, to put names to some of them, um, you know, object-oriented classes with inheritance in C++ with, um, you know, I forget even what the name of it, but, there's various levels of like seriousness about them. And one of them that was very serious was, you know, somebody in the audience knows the name for this. When you're not allowed to construct an object that is in an incomplete state, 
right? So you end up with these constructors with like 27 parameters because that's how yeah, much yeah, information yeah. you need. Yeah. And oh. like all those kinds I'll of things, th those were all ideas about how to make programs have fewer bugs or be simpler and more understandable, right? And they turned into some perverse explosion that went the opposite direction. And yet nobody, re it took a long time, let's say, for people to start admitting that, and there are entire factions of programmers that still won't admit it. Now in the games industry, I think we're a lot more reality-based, and so there's a growing faction of programmers in games that wants to keep code as simple as possible because they've seen that these other things don't really work out. Now as simple as possible actually means very complicated and hard to deal with, right? Because yep. the problems are hard, yep. but there are, there are certain kinds of abstractions that will address your problem and help you solve it. And there are other kinds that are just like stylistic extras that somebody wants you to do that actually make your problem harder because they're not necessary. And we're learning how to clean those out. And it's been a long process that's been difficult actually. And, and, and the problem is a lot of the rest of the programming field doesn't have problems as hard as ours. Yeah. So yeah, that's they don't have the same pressures. And so, they think things are fine that we don't think are fine because they're doing easy stuff and they think their easy stuff is hard. So they're like, we're doing all this hard stuff. And I'm like, no, you haven't, you haven't seen how hard it can get. And so it's hard to communicate across these gaps. And I guess you just get different cultures. And our job, I think, is to, when you have a problem as hard as ours, maybe somebody really, you know, maybe making spreadsheets for payment processing software really is a lot harder than I think it is, but I don't think so, right? Um, but maybe they'll come up with their thing and we'll come up with our thing and um, something will eventually get better, but it's a hard problem. Yeah. And, and it, it, the problem has to be respected. And the problem that you have in the games industry, <laughs> you know, you have several generations of programmers and the older programmers are combat hardened and they're just like, look, a lot of them are just like, look, I'm just going to use C++, it's what here, it's what works. And then the younger people who are just out of college are like, I want to invent the big splashy thing. And, and they don't necessarily, first, they don't necessarily have enough experience to know why, why somebody already did that 20 years ago and it didn't work. But also... Um, when you're new, I think you don't have enough respect for the problems. These problems are really hard. And until you've spent, you know, 36 hours in a row awake trying to fix one little bug that shouldn't be there, yeah. that was a serious problem. I mean, a lot of us <laughs> probably did that in high school for stupid problems, but, but one that was like really serious, um, and until you've done that like 10 times, you maybe don't get it, right? You don't yeah. get, and, and so it's hard to be in the right place even to solve these problems competently now. Yeah. Otherwise we would have more solutions. Yeah, I, I think in my perspective, uh, things have evolved like programming languages evolved uh, from the 60s at the same pace as uh, hardware was evolving. So. I think at the time it was easy to see some kind of parody and the need for things to evolve in a specific way. Whereas now, um, potentially things are slightly detached if we consider uh, a huge chunk of the development world, like, like you were saying, like banks, or, I mean, oh, they have 37 concurrent users at peak time, ooh. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the real, there are problems that need to be solved, obviously, but um, in games world, in, in the games industry, we have so many more um, problems that need to be solved at the spot, like performance-wise, like, uh, um, Tons of computational problems and, and challenges that we need to solve. And, and therefore, um, we also help to develop technology and, and to uh, push technology forward, especially if we look at things like graphics cards and um, some CPU architecture and all that. However, languages are evolving independently from us. Uh, they, they have their own lives. <clears throat> it's not like the, the, the challenges that we have have been a springboard for every 
modern language uh, to to evolve or to uh, create new new and better ways of uh, solving problems. There have been languages that potentially have sprang out of the, these needs, but not necessarily everything. Um, and we, we were just talking uh, outside that, uh, for instance, C++ that has been so widely adopted by so many of us for our core tech, um, it has evolved outside of games. Um, and there may be some inputs that come from people like us who work uh, on these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, it has evolved separately. On the other side, you are working on a programming language, so that uh, it's, it, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm <laughs> paraphrasing, but it kind of uh, it tries to solve some of these problems, uh, being extremely focused on game development. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, <laughs> um, you know, usually when a language gets designed, especially historically, many of them are designed in an academic setting, or else some of them come out of a business setting, but for relatively simple problems, you know. Um, and what I was finding was, um, you know, in games we tend to hit problems earlier than people in other industries, and um, uh, in, in ways that are more complicated, right? And so I actually wanted to design something based on based on that experience to, to try to solve the problems that are really hard, you know? Because everybody, um, you know, I, I, I feel like there's all, all these features that go into language design that are, come from the designer thinking about problems that are actually not that hard, which can be a little bit important if there are constant frictions, but it's not the same as as a brick wall that you run up against eventually. So for example, people talk all the time about, oh, um, it's really important not to leak memory, right? And so you get all of these quite complex um, systems put into place to make sure that you free your memory or whatever, right? And they, they impact your performance quite heavily. But like, what, what I try to tell people is memory leaks are not actually very bad. I mean, you shouldn't have them in your shipping game, but you can go almost all the way up until ship with a lot of memory leaks. And um, it's no big deal because you're restarting it all the time anyway and you never get to the point where it matters. Like for us, the much harder problem than freeing memory is I mean, when you're a beginner, it could seem hard, but once you're experienced, it's, it's pretty easy. You just make, if your code's too complicated to understand when you should free the memory, just simplify your code, right? But the hard part is to know how the game should behave and like, what should this system be like? And do we need to rewrite this three times for it to be the right thing? And so I consider it very important to be able to rough draft your code um, and treat it as a little bit disposable and not as production code for a long time until you get it figured out. And then you're like, okay, this is the thing that we want. Now let's harden it. Let's make sure there aren't memory leaks. Let's go over all the if statements and make sure that the logic makes sense and all of that, right? Um, and th this is where I differ with languages like Rust, for example, which has one of these ways of making sure you free memory, one that doesn't impact performance as much as other systems. Um, but Rust's mindset is that all code is production code. And I think that's deadly because it's so hard to make games that if you slow down the iteration loop by 10 or 15%, both of my previous projects probably would have failed or they would have been worse games because they were so hard to program. If you make it harder, I can't do it anymore. And so I'm trying to make it easier by looking at the things that are actually problems, right? And the problems are, what are the real problems? I don't understand my program. It's too big and complicated. I don't, I don't know what it does. Sometimes when I go to debug it, it takes too long and I don't know what the problem is, right? Um, sometimes I have to write big systems that are a little bit error prone because the language doesn't have features to help me out. So with C++, that would be, there's no reflection or introspection yeah. system, although Natively. word is they're gonna add it to C++ 26, and I'm yeah. sure it's gonna be the worst thing ever. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are real hard problems like this. Um, 
or, or just like, I, so I got into programming when I was a little kid. I was 10 years old and computers were so exciting. And I just could type, you know, 10 print hello and it was so cool. And I made a, a game when I was in school. Yeah, I was 10 or 11 years old. It was a stupid game, but, but I made one. And it was so exciting and fun. And now I'm a professional programmer and programming sucks and is horrible and it makes me an unhappy person. And I think that's most programmers' experience. That's a, a problem that we could attack and solve. And nobody, everyone's worried about, are you gonna free that memory? Yeah. Are you gonna free that memory? <laughs> and it's like, no, what about programming sucks? Yeah. Can we attack that problem? So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. And of course it's difficult. I'm not saying that I know how to make programming fun again. Um, I know how to make it, I know how to get rid of some of the problems, but, but that's what I aim for, right, is um, given, given that I have a bunch of experience using systems languages, right, so I'm not trying to make a language for non-programmers, I'm not trying to make a language for um, people who don't want to think about memory, right, it's, it's decidedly a systems language, but like, what are the real problems, and can we move the line on the real problems, even a little bit, because I don't think that line has moved. Like C++ was an attempt to improve C and, and make it better to, to do better programs. And I think a few things from C++ help, but it's really just a few. Most of the features in C++ don't help at all and in fact make things worse, um, in my opinion, again. Um, I don't really use anything after C++ 11. And from, from the stuff before 11, I don't use multiple inheritance. I barely use templates, hardly at all. I don't use the standard library. Everything now is in the standard library. It's a giant mess that I don't, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and I'm not alone in this. There's, there's just, there's a, um, a subfield of programmers who take a similar attitude, right? And so I'm just trying to say like, look, <laughs> so I was talking to Casey Muratori, who some people here may know. And he was saying, you know, if I were to design a programming language today, it would be about managing wave fronts because the, you know, the future of, of CPUs is this massively parallel stuff like you have on, on GPUs. And I said to him, yeah, that's a good thing to work on, but like, I think we stopped in the 1990s, right? So I'm just trying to make, what should we have made even in 1996? Like what would have been the next step forward back then? Because I feel that that's how, for how long that we've been stagnating. I think we've been stuck on the Van Neumann architecture and kind of developed some things. But, but, but yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> but Von Neumann is easier than, than other things. And so true. if we can't even do that, <laughs> right, what, how are we going to do when we open up the paradigm? I, do, do you think... Uh, quantum computing is something real for the next, for our lifetime? Um, I've had you a little really bit of exposure to quantum computing. You'll be using it for making games, because that's you know, what matters, right? Um, I mean, my understanding of it, uh, you know, I took, for fun, I took, I took the Berkeley, I, I went to Berkeley for college, and then they, they did a class online that I took later on, because this wasn't offered when I yeah. was in college. Um, I think you could only ever visualize it as being a kind of a coprocessor, right? Because there's just this, it's, a quantum computer isn't a computer in the way that we think yeah. about programming computers. It's more like, um, uh, it's a circuit for computing a specific thing, right. right? And you could maybe make multiple circuits that compute multiple different things in a way that compose, but, D doing that in a general way that would be a programm programming language is basically, it would be so different from what we do today because everything in, as long as you stay quantum, which is where the power comes from, everything has to be reversible. So you really can't have side effects. That's actually where the, the functional people, everything has to be a bijection though. It's, yeah, it's even yeah, stricter yeah, yeah, than yeah, functional, yeah. right? Yeah. So I don't know, that's maybe, <laughs> Maybe we can leave that for question time, because yeah, yeah, that's, that's a little bong toking. So let's move to another topic that kind of, uh, it's a bit of a segue of what we've just been discussing. Uh, it's, it's something that I struggle with, and I think anyone who has done any uh, recent engineering hiring has struggled with, which is um, 
nowadays, there's a clear distinction between what I'm, I'm going to call, this is just uh, a way of naming things, uh, software engineers and engine programmers. So I've had cases where people who um, uh, have been working, let's say, an engine like Unity for some time, um, but they cannot make a console program in the same language they are used to working in uh, Unity. They cannot make something, right, uh, something to a console, that they cannot do an executable uh, program in Windows to, I don't know, do a hello world. Um, I think this is kind of a problem for when we want to hire people to help us solve difficult yeah. problems and challenges. Yeah. And uh, the fact that now things are simple, which should be a good thing, uh, brings us other layers of problems like this one. What do you think we, we should be doing in order to uh, minimize this problem? I think there's a pretty serious problem that started happening in programming culture. I mean, it's been, it's been in programming for as long as I've been in. And this is beyond games even, this is everywhere. Yeah. Um, people don't have a clear picture of what knowledge is deep versus what knowledge is shallow, right? So if you, if you go to school and you're a good student and you learn the difference between n log n and n squared, right? That's deep knowledge that will apply in many cases and it's something fundamental about computers, right? Um, on the other hand, if you go on Hacker News and read an article about somebody learning a specific JavaScript API and tutorializing it, right? That's very shallow knowledge because it's just, you're, you're learning about arbitrary decisions that somebody made about how to interface with a thing that you're not even trying to understand, right? And that, but that knowledge became very popular since, let's say since 2005, once, once this second boom of programming happened and everybody realized, oh, you can make a lot of money in programming or whatever, all these people showed up and they just want the job where they could do JavaScript and so they just learn the API, right? And so th there's been a deluge of shallow knowledge. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that because part of the way that you learn deep knowledge is by looking at shallow things and reading the pattern underneath. Like if there's an API to do something, if it's a good API, then by looking at the API choices, you can understand the problem okay. and the mechanic. Even if you can't see the code, it's better if you could see the code inside. But if you can't, you can still f see some things about the mechanics. And yeah. you know, one example of that is a graphics API. It's like, okay, they want me to like put the vertex data into a buffer and like lock the buffer and then not touch it. Why is that? Oh, it's going to the GPU and all this stuff, right? You can figure this out. On the other hand, if it's a bad API, which most APIs are, it'll be full of stuff that's stupid. And, um, or even cargo culting where they're copying a good API. So my favorite example of this was when Microsoft did Direct 2D, which was taking Direct 3D, which was successful, and then trying to add font rendering and all that to that. They made um, an ARGB color, right? So red, green, blue, and alpha, a lockable resource so to create one of these, you had to like lock it and fill the color data and unlock it. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're doing. And I actually told Microsoft this and they didn't, they did not like my opinion on that. Um, but they were just copying, oh, Direct3D has you lock things and fill them. And so let's do that here. And it was completely absurd. So, um, so, how to fix it, we, there just isn't much of an idea right now of what an actual respectable engineer is, you know? Like if you think back to like civil engineering, like people who build bridges or whatever, you think of people who are responsible and know things well and, and make sure they're right because it's important to be right. We don't really have that in software at all it's completely dead as far as I can tell. And part of the reason it's dead is because nobody can tell what's right because it's just a bunch of people arguing in a loud room and, nah, 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 and yeah. like no real information gets through. And 
if anybody has an idea how to solve that, I would love to hear that idea. I don't know. The only way that I know to solve it is to just do better in an obvious way. And, but even that maybe doesn't win, right? Because all these JavaScript frameworks are still popular, even though they're all yeah, the same as each other, right? You have NPMs to just to pad things because no yeah. one wants to write code anymore. And in the same way, the market can remain irrational longer than you could remain solvent. Um, I think software industry culture could remain stupid longer than you're alive. Like, that's just possible. Um, so I'm going to do, I'm doing what I can do, but I'm very conscious that I have a limited ability to affect this giant thing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, w one of the things, one of the examples that I usually uh, hand out to, um, well, uh, trying to, to answer that why is it important to fully understand what we're doing uh, has to do with um, inlining. We're still doing, we're still inlining stuff because it makes sense. It, it's not like... You mean like manually typing? Yeah, man code manually, in, like not yeah. using uh, some library because it has everything apparently uh, neatly done for what we want to do, but then it's so underperformant that it really doesn't help, and uh, which leads us back to the famous uh, inverse square root example, or, uh, you know, uh, if, even I've watched a, uh, a talk by Unity, this is 2018, I think, about how someone from the UI team was saying, don't use our stuff, just manually do your own shit because this is hasn't been <laughs> touched for ages uh, and uh, when you do something here it will put out the canvas set as dirty and we'll rewrite everything each frame so don't do this inline a bunch of stuff so when you have uh, an someone from an engine, a commercial engine, saying don't use our stuff, reminds me once while I was working on a, a non-games project where once in the code I saw uh, an error message that, said, that, that would prompt the user saying, um, warning, do not save even if asked to do so. So that gives you that kind of um, trust or but that, lack thereof. <laughs> That, this is what I'm talking about, though, because what does it mean? There are, this is so funny. I mean, there are smaller examples of this in code all the time, but when you see do not save even if asked to do so, that's a clear representation that these programmers are not in control of their program anymore. Right. Right. They cannot control what right. it does. They're scared of it, right? And, but yeah. we've all seen versions of this that are maybe smaller than that. But like, oh, I'm calling out to some API. Like, in Visual Studio, a professional product by Microsoft that I think is much easier than a video game, you know, <laughs> you step the code and the cursor like flashes back and forth like 30 times, right? Because it's like, because it's filling out text in widgets and somewhere 10 functions down, there's like a set cursor. Yeah. When you when, when you do something, right? Like, yeah. And they're just not in control. And this is common, right? It's common. I think we've all seen this if we have enough experience. And it's it's a problem because that that marks the point at which you can cannot go beyond. Like look, if you're putting up that window that says don't save, you obviously can't do a program much more complicated than the one that you're already doing. You're at the breaking point. And what we're trying to do, as we try to advance games, we're trying to do more, we're trying to do things that are more ambitious, that means moving the threshold of what you're able to do. And honestly, I haven't seen that move very quickly lately, right? Um, you know, sort of the last time it really moved very much was around 2015 when everybody started doing open world, right? And since then, everybody's still kind of doing open world. Like, I don't know, like what, maybe there's a lack of ideas also, but the systems are just not actually getting more sophisticated. So um, I feel we, we have been at that breaking point for going on 10 years, and 10 years is a long time, 
that's more than many people have been in the games industry. And so maybe those people don't see that it used to go faster, right. you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So we're almost out of time. Uh, so I'd like to uh, show, oh, sorry, um, ask you a question that uh, Warren. I, I would like to say more optimistic things as well. I feel like I've said <laughs> some negative things today. Yeah. So let's move into the, the optimist thing. Um, yeah. Warren was talking about the definition of success. What yeah. do you think um, defines success in our area and in particularly in uh, the engineering side of game development? I do think it's important for people to have individual notions of success because one of the ways that things move forward is that if I'm a little bit wrong about what's good to do, but somebody else has a different idea, that person, that person moves the ball forward when I didn't, right? So, so I will say that. Um, for me personally, um, when I make this programming language, for example, um, there are several levels of success I could imagine, um, but, but I don't consider, they're nested in a certain way, in the following way. Um, like I said in the beginning, I wanna make real, verifiable improvements that actually help with hard problems, not easy problems, okay? If I don't succeed at that, then other layers of success I'm not interested in because we've seen, so, so another layer of success could be, okay, I design a language and I think it's good and then also it's successful and lots of programmers use it, right? That would be great, but I don't wanna be successful if the thing isn't good because I feel like that's been the trajectory of most languages, right? There's somehow, a lot of programming languages are essentially pollution that is being externalized into the world because people make something, it's not really any better than other things. Even if it's equally as good as another language, that's pollution because now there's more yeah. ways to do things and expertise is spread, I don't know. I, I don't wanna go into that, but um, so, I feel like that gets done way too much. One of my pet peeves that like, people probably won't understand this in the, in the time we have to explain, but if you go, if you read an old academic paper or you go on Hacker News or something, there'll be some system or programming language or whatever, and the format that you tell people about is, you know, cool name, often in capital letters, colon, a programming language to help program fur dolls or something, I don't know, right? <laughs> um, it's putting the name first. It's like fundamentally an advertising exercise and that's wrong. Right. We've done way too much of that. We've done way too much making things that aren't that good and broadcasting them into the internet. The internet amplified this and made it much worse. Yeah. So like, for me personally, I want the quality to be there and then m maybe the next step doesn't succeed because maybe people don't agree with me about quality or don't recognize quality or something flashy gets everybody's attention, right? And they're like a cat following a laser. I can't control that. But, but if, if it does become successful, I'll be happy with that. I'll be happier than if it didn't. Um, but, but that's contingent on the quality for me. And then third goal in a, in a, in a sphere outside that is maybe, um, because there's some long-term roadmap of us understanding how to program, understanding software. And for a while, we were doing a good job like trekking along that road and making progress. And I feel like that has slowed down. But I don't think it's necessary that we stop. I think, I think we can make more progress. And so nudging that a little bit, right? And helping contribute to that long-term progress would be great. But again, I think that contribution is only valid or legitimate when it's really helping and it's not fluff. Sure. And, 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 and that makes perfect sense because we should be uh, uh, adding something that brings positive or... Uh, we, I think we are all tired of a zero-sum game uh, in terms of tech. Uh, we just want to make things better and we want to give back better things to the world. I think 
we should be doing that. But how can you make sure, how, how do you, how can you achieve that, considering that there are so many, you know, giant companies that monopolize so many things? Like, the, the things that you've said in, in previous uh, talks, like, how hard it is nowadays to put a pixel on the screen. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, one of my first computers was a Spectrum, and I just did plot 10, 20. There you go, pixel at 10, 20 coordinates. So nowadays I have to get tons of libraries just to make that it's happen. It's insane, yeah. Um, is, <laughs> I find it hard with, with, at the point where we are to go back to a place where we can... Well, it won't be as easy because we've grown so used to doing things, doing other things easily that weren't easy back then. But where's the compromise? And at the same point, where do we compromise to a point where we can all <laughs> walk together to uh, a place of more beauty than the one? I have two answers person. to this, and one is a negative answer and one is a positive <laughs> answer. And because I want to leave on positive, I'll yeah. say the negative first. Um, see that. Which is, again, we have to go back to what's programming culture. Right? right? Because wh when programmers go to all these companies, they're following some ideas of how they learned and, and what they learned. And what, uh, I, what I would say about millennial and Gen Z culture from afar is that it places a big emphasis on being part of the community of programmers and having a positive attitude about, you could do it, everybody can do it, and um, uh, it's a positive thing just to put some code out in the world, right? I don't think that's true. Nobody would say that about bridges. Nobody would say everybody could build a bridge that is going to be in the center of town that everyone's going to drive across. Um, yeah. Now, that said, there's a lot more software. There probably shouldn't be as much software as there is, but there's a lot in poetry. Like, I have to work hard to somehow be a good poet, and that's, like, understood. But with software, we don't understand that. Right? Everybody thinks it's just positive to just, you know, throw some garbage on GitHub and want everybody to use it. So, um, the positive thing <laughs> is, is just to say it's, it's the mystery of the world that um, you can be an example somehow in, in all sorts of fields, not just software. Like, there are individual people who do interesting things that the world's going about its business and nobody has any right to notice it, but somehow people do and it becomes influential. And, and that's my model, is I'm just going to try to do some things that are good and show them as examples. And it's the same thing I do in game design. Just try to design some things that are good, put them out there, hopefully people will recognize that, right? And, and that's all that I know how to do. I don't think I can go force IBM to be right. good programmers, right? Thank you. Can to sure. change ourselves. So this kind of wraps it up. Thank you so much for uh, attending. And thank you, Jonathan and Tiago. Like this has been really, really good. And but, but, but wait, 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 wait. Yes. But now we still have time for Q and A and to open up the forum for discussion. So yeah, let's do a round of applause and then like who who has some questions for uh, our speakers. <laughs> I see some questions in the back. Thank you for the great conversation. Um, I'm curious, we have, I make this analogy with music, we have a lot of bad music, we have a lot of bad code. So right now, don't we have enough? Do we need another language? How can we actually work on the problem of trimming all of the noise that people are learning, wasting their time? What would be the approach for, for this? Well, th this is a fundamental paradox, right? Um, because we do have, there's too much complication. There's too many things. There's, and this applies to everything, not just programming languages, but if you wanted to write some library code to do something, there's probably another library that does at least some of that, right? And so every programmer 
has to find a way. I would like it if people were thinking about exactly what you said, right? But not in a defeatist way. Because if, if you just say, well, there's already so much stuff, there can't be any more things, I will therefore stop programming, then there's no hope, right? <laughs> and there has to be hope. So I, my way is just, again, to be very serious about making sure that what I'm doing is really an improvement. Um, and it probably has to be a big, even small improvements may not offset the amount of damage that they do by adding more stuff. And so it has to be a big improvement, right? Um, and that's one reason. So I've been making this programming language. Um, I started it, I think, in 2014. It wasn't full-time back then, but that's nine years ago. Um, I don't think most people, and well, and my first demo of it, which I think was at the end of 2014, I showed a video game, like I made a video game in this programming language. I think most people would have put that out into the world at that time, but I've held on to it, and we're making bigger and more difficult things in it exactly to make sure it's good enough to then put out and, and make sure it's a real improvement. And, um, I don't know that I would ask that everybody spend nine years on everything they do, but I do think um, I, I do think they should ask themselves that same question: like, why why is this better than what's already there? And um, because it's weird, you know, you don't have the same question if you're a fiction author. Like, somehow, if you write a new book of fiction and you put it in the world, it doesn't really do damage. It's just more things, and then future writers might read it or they might not. But somehow in software, that's not, we're just making a bigger mess all the time. And, and we need to get control of the size of the mess. And um, it, is, it is the most important thing, actually. Like if we don't get control of the size of the mess, at some point, progress will no longer be possible. And, and yeah, and, and so I'm thinking about that all the time. And my answer is just to work hard to make sure it's good. Can I just add something to that? Um, you were talking about adding a lot of mess, and the other day someone removed the package and uh, the internet broke. So Again? <laughs> this has happened I mean, a number of times. I mean, this is constantly happening. Yeah. I think one of the important things has to do with education and uh, making sure that people know exactly what they're doing. That's a great question. It means that you're concerned about the impact of your work and your legacy in the world. Uh, we have been struggling uh, uh, with that as a species lately. Like in the 90s, we cloned the sheep. And nowadays, we keep trying to tell people that the Earth is not flat. So uh, it's, it's, it's something that we have somewhat lost over time that we need to get back at and make sure that people like strive to be the better version of themselves in what they do as well. Yeah. So I think that's very important. We, we need to, to make sure that we're not leaving. It's, it's like I go to a public space and I, I don't leave my, I don't litter. I, anything I bring, I just clean it and bring it with me or put it on the garbage can. I will not leave a space worse than it was when I got there. So it's the same principle. Uh, it's, it's very philosophical and uh, an ethical <laughs> point of view, but uh, I, th I think it's really important that we, we ask ourselves, do we actually need another padding NPM out there? Yes. Uh, do we actually need to, instead of if, call it something else? Uh, you know? <laughs> I think it comes down to that. One more short thing to add to what I was saying, which is, it, you know, sometimes people doubt statements like, if the complexity keeps increasing, someday no more progress will be possible because it sounds very dramatic. But this has already happened in a lot of subfields. Like, just like look at desktop operating systems, pick Linux or Windows or whatever. Like, both of those things got very complex. They're arguably much more complex than they need to be to do the job. And they're just both treading water, and Windows is doing a lot more of making obvious changes that don't actually make anything better, in fact, make things worse. There's like, if, if you wanna make sure your, uh, your speaker volume is right, there's like four or five different places to go in Windows now. Um, maybe six if you count the browser. 
and, and, but nothing is really better. And that's the future of all software if we don't get discipline about this. It's pretty obvious, actually. Right, do we have more questions? Uh, we have one here. Thank you. Um, I'm here for, can I? Thank you. Oh, oh. Sorry, like we have a conflict. Well, I'm here for an inspiration as well. I know we are discussing uh, future of software development in video games, but um, I want to, you mentioned uh, programming is a struggle, right? And uh, my question is, what made you keep on going during the development of Braid or prototyping, and what was putting you down and what was lifting you up during this uh, period? <laughs> um, we have time. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big question. I mean, Braid was only three and a half years. That's not that bad. I mean, it seemed like a really long time at the time. I wish I could go back to projects that only took three and a half years. Um, <laughs> in fact, I, I hope to. Uh, but just for me, it's always been making sure the idea feels important. Like, before that, I was always starting projects and then abandoning them when they got hard. And it was just because I didn't, like, there's some threshold as a programmer, like, you have to think something's kind of neat to get started on it. Like, oh, this is exciting, right? Maybe it's exciting enough to sustain you for a week. Is it exciting enough to sustain you for a month? Is it exciting enough that a year later you'll still think it was a good idea? These are different thresholds, and you just have to make sure that it's pretty strong, you know? Um, it, it's also something that gets easier with experience, though, because after you've done it the first time or two, you can take a new idea and say, is this as good as my old idea? Sometimes the answer might be no, but is it, is it in the same neighborhood? Um, but if it's your first time, you don't have that experience, and so you just have to guess and then have, maybe have some discipline to just help in the end. But yeah, it's hard, like especially when you're in the middle of a project, it's not good yet, it doesn't totally work yet. Um, so it's not, like the vision in your mind about what was supposed to be super cool is not being fulfilled and this can feel depressing because you could start making a story about how you're simply never going to get there. Um, you just have to realize that that's a story and you don't have to listen to it and you can just keep making progress as well. Hello. Um, yeah, so continuing on the pessimism train. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the analogy with the bridges. Um, a lot of the bridges have been built, like the, the technology required to build the bridges has been there for quite a while, and yeah. there's suffered several iterations. And my question is, isn't that our biggest problem? Our area is very recent. We don't know what is kept strong and throughout the ages, and was, which hmm. is going to inevitably, inevitably fall. Maybe, but also, you know, it was, um, you know, uh, 40 years from between the discovery of uh, special relativity, not even general relativity, and us blowing up huge bombs all over the place, which were very complicated and difficult to make, right? We arguably haven't made that kind of progress in software. And one reason why is because you said, um, I forget exactly what you said, but, but it was something about us, us it, 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 because it's new, we don't really know what's right. But I, I don't think it's only because it's new, because we're not that new anymore. Right, so programming kind of started in the 1950s. So, you know, it's been 75 years or something, um, maybe a little less. Um, but part of the problem is that some discipline like physics or chemistry is very objective. You see the result, right? If two chemicals reacted and generated heat, you see the number, you see how much. And in programming, we have a bunch of people claiming that things are better or claiming that things are achieved that are not very easily measurable. They're not as objective. And so um, it's just very easy to be fooled by these claims and then end up going down a road that is 
ultimately not very productive or promising, right? And we've done a lot of that. And um, how can we improve that? That's, that's an important question. You know, every university has this field called computer science, right? But when you look at computer science, the actual serious part of computer science is just actually more like computer math. It's like doing the O of N squared stuff and proving things about programs. But the, the analogy to physics that's actual science isn't really there. Like we just, we, we, we don't have a way to do a physics experiment on software. And, and like if you put up two programs, you wrote the same program two different ways. Um, which one's better, right? How do you know? We, we don't really know. And you know, there have been attempts to answer that question, but they're all controversial and inconclusive. And so um, that's, if anyone out there wants to work on that problem, that's an actual very important problem that I don't know what to do about. And, and, and one of the things that we will be having more and more are all these areas that are even newer than the ones we are discussing about. Like for instance, uh, recently I've been somewhat more connected to uh, engineering for space exploration. Uh, and it's crazy the kind of things that you also have to consider uh, and how experimental things are. Uh, like when you send a rover to, um, to space, um, like we've seen recently, you, you don't just you don't have a remote and you're just piloting the rover. No, you send. I want you to walk three units forward and then stop and then move around. Or when you're trying to calculate how can we get, I don't know, to a body in space, to Mars, to the Moon, the amount of variables that you need to consider, and and the fact that uh, in in orbital dynamics, uh, you cannot really. Um, calculate, uh, if you have more than two bodies with their own masses and, and dynamics, they cannot really calculate the exact position of three bodies at a given point in time. You can assume that if some things uh, are happening in, in a certain way, they will probably be here. But because it's a stochastic problem, there's no way you can ever uh, know for sure. Um, we're still figuring things out. And sometimes we're making things as we're figuring things out. Uh, are we gonna be leaving this kind of uh, building the railroad as the train is approaching? I don't know. Uh, I think not, I don't think so. And, and, and that's why the novelty, the, 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 bridge th the bridges thing is, is a great example. Bridges has been here since antiquity, and what is the equivalent of the, the um, what's the name of the thing, the, um, uh, the resonance thing whereupon a bridge may collapse if you have a, uh, the, the resonant frequency problem in software. What is the equivalent of a, <laughs> I have no idea. Is it a solar flare that suddenly I, we, we are all in a stone age? I actually have an answer to that question, but it's off topic, so <laughs> okay. we, won't, we won't cover it here. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that's, that's, if we were treating this as a real science, you would have questions and answers of that kind, and the list would be pretty long, actually. Yeah.